our Dharma sharing of the Breaking Myth series number 21 titled, Would You Cry When I Die? Please help us to click like and share our Facebook page. If you have any questions, please post your comments on the Facebook and we will read out your questions during the Q&A sessions later. Please do allow me to give a brief introduction about Dr. Punya Wong, our distinguished speaker for tonight. Dr. Wong Yin On graduated from the University of Malaya. He joined Monash University Malaysia in 2007 as Associate Professor in Internal Medicine to form the pioneer faculty of the clinical school in Johor Bahru. Dr. Wong is based in Johor Bahru since 1990. He has been sharing the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta the past two decades and was an invited speaker at the 3rd, 7th and 8th Global Conferences on Buddhism. Dr. Wong authored his first Dharma book entitled Walking in the Buddha's Footprints, 100 Reflective Essays, back in 2016. He had recently launched his second Dharma book entitled Breaking Myths, and is now sharing chapters from his book weekly on Friday nights. Without further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Punya Wong. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Sister Eileen. Please allow me to share the screen. Just to check, Sister Eileen, is the screen seen your side? Okay. All right. Good evening, Dhamma family. And as we come close to Qingming, I thought that this would be a good topic. And of course, the title is a teaser. Will you cry when I die? That's a teaser to get us interested and reflect as I'm going to ask every one of us in this audience to ask ourselves that question. When we die, who will cry? Now, the only reason I read the newspapers nowadays is to actually read the obituaries. For that is about the only thing true in the entire spread of the newspapers. The tragedy of life is actually not death, but what we let die inside of us while we live. And one of the very important teachings of the Buddha is that we are to reflect constantly on death as a protective meditation. And in fact, the Buddha advised that we should reflect on death every day as it would help us live our lives better. Lately, we see a lot of famous people having passed on. Uh, the very popular comedian, and Hong Kong has departed. And before that, another very eminent actress, Lee Hyung Kam, etc., etc. And almost every day in our internet news or Facebook, we read of people that we know passing away. So death is something that we all will have to face. It's only the time that is uncertain. And the Buddha had always asked us to look at it as something that will be inevitable for all of us. And when we read the obituaries, we're gonna see that this person who has passed on was born in 1940 and then passed away 2021. And then we say, ah, he was born here and he passed away there without coming into consciousness that the most important thing is not the year in which he was born, neither the year in which he passed away. What is important is that dash in between when he was born and when he passed. 
across the way. Because that dash is where he spent his entire life doing things or not doing things. When we say doing things, we mean he is doing intentional action, which is karma. The Buddha said karma is all our intentional actions, chattana. It is something that we do by body, speech, and mind with full consciousness. And that is what creates karma, which will give rise to effects. And it's not as exotic as <clears throat> what <clears throat> many of us imagine it is. It is just a basic principle that whatever we do will create a ripple effect good or bad. And whatever we not do is, of course, in the precepts that we just took. And those are things that we train ourselves to abstain from doing. So if you can understand this, the dash, we will understand that we can live our lives a lot by choice rather than by mere chance and a lot by design rather than by default. In many ways, the ways that we behave the ways that we respond or react is actually by default. We are so conditioned from small that we will inevitably respond in a predictable manner, especially a manner that is fueled by greed or lust or anger or a big concern over what will I get out of it. It revolves around the word I. And it takes someone who studies the Buddha Dharma and makes a conscious decision to let his life be lived by choice. As for example, we took the five precepts just now. Nobody forced it on us. The Buddha did not give us any commandments. It is our choice that we would like to live our lives guided by these traffic lights. Knowing that if we are to rush through these traffic lights, we are going to get into trouble. So aging, sickness, and death is inevitable. But in between aging, sickness, decay, and death, there is also a lot of time for us to do many things. And even when our bodies are aging, sick, and decaying, our minds, the Buddha kept reminding us, need not be sick. That means we can be shot by one arrow in the body, which is the arrow of physiological decay, that being inevitable. But our minds need not be sick. You know, all of us in this audience now, if we look at our own minds, be it five years ago, 10 years ago, or 15, or even 30 years ago, unless we've got some organic problems that have given rise to very rapid degeneration of our minds, our minds are still active, fresh, and in many ways, we describe it as young. We say our body has aged, but my mind is still young. Actually, we are expressing the words, which is reality, that yes, our body, body will age, decay, fall sick, but our minds can be kept fresh, young, and not sick. And the Buddha, in fact, wants us to be not shot by the second arrow, which will make us grow what we will call cynical, or selfish, or irritating, but to remain fresh and young in our minds, even when our bodies face the inevitable ravages of time. So you see Calvin and Hobbes here now, my favorite cartoon philosopher. And Calvin says, I don't understand this business about death. If we are just going to die, what's the point of living? And then the two of them stare into space. Yes, it is inevitable that one day we are all going to die. But today we are alive. 
now we are alive. We will die one day, but now we are alive. Tomorrow we may be alive. Next year, next decade, we may still be alive. So there is still a lot of things that we can do despite knowing that aging, sickness, and death is an inevitable consequence of human life. So how do we live well amidst all this? And that is what the Buddha Dharma teaches us. Yes, we are aware of the first noble truth. It tells us that dukkha, aging, sickness, birth, etc., is the common denominator of mankind. But it also tells us that we can live following the fourth noble truth very well amidst all these changes. And if we can learn as we walk to not have the greed, lust, hatred, delusion overwhelm us, we can in fact activate the third noble truth and that is live a life that is free of greed, hatred, and delusion. You know, when a baby is born, he cries while the rest of the world rejoices. Often I wonder, is he crying because he knows, oh no, not another round. So let us live our life in such a way that when we die, we will rejoice for a life that is well lived and the people who are witnessing or attending that week says, we do not have to worry. This is a life that is well lived. So this is inevitable, our physical change. And you know, my wife collects all my passport photos and there we are, years and years of passport photos stuck together. You will notice there is no renewal of the latest. My passport is expired. But we say, what's the point of renewing? We're not going anywhere. So we'll wait for the airport to open before we renew it. We're just wasting money. But here you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times five, 35 years of passport renewals. And it shows the inevitable fact of life. Let us make use of this time. Let us travel now to the future, all of us, every one of us here. Let us travel to the future and then look back. Who will cry when we die? Who will say, oh, don't worry, he has lived a good life. A good life well lived is long enough. How many lives have you touched when we have this privilege to walk on this earth? We are all familiar with this Buddha's teaching that a human life is very precious. Right now we have a human life. It is very precious. So let us make use of this well. And for those of us aging ones, those waga amas among us here, those of us here who have withdrawn your EPF and living on your pension, every moment is precious because time is one commodity that is ever decreasing. But also when we know the ultimate reality of things, we know that you do not have to seek for eternal life. Yesterday, a good friend texted me with a topic to discuss, and that is with regards to another friend of his who asked him that in his opinion, life is not worth living if he does not have eternal life as a promise. He asked, what do you think, Dr. Wong? What is your opinion? I replied, for all the people out there who think like that, that is one crucial thing that they are missing. Sister Eileen, you do not have to wait for eternal life. You are in eternal life right now. And this eternal life that you are waiting for, not you, but for the others, what are you going to do in that eternal life that you wish to have? You're going to be doing the exact same thing as you are doing now. If you are not a person who has 
train your mind and change your priorities. Right now, we are in eternal life. And in that eternal life, we have created heavens and we have created hells. And I told this brother, for the friend who is going to go to his next life, which he considers eternal, if he is unchanged, he is similarly going to create a heaven or a hell out of it. And the way to create a heaven on earth or a hell on earth is entirely our making. So I think it is very important that all of us listening in now realize a fundamental teaching, a fundamental fact. Energy can never be created or destroyed. It is merely transformed. The atoms in our body, every carbon, every nitrogen came from the stars. They are billions of years old, nearly transformed from one state to another. And you and me, all of us, are already in eternal life, transforming every moment. And that's why I like the Chinese word for death. The Chinese use the word wang shen for death which means you're literally going on to another state, another birth, be it in whatever form. You're not dead, you're just in transit. Now, this is paraphrased from the Dhammapada, that if a man speaks or acts with an evil thought, with something that is filled with greed, hatred, and delusion, then pain will follow him like the wheels that follow the ox. And if a man speaks and acts from a pure thought, non-greed, non-delusion, non-hatred, then happiness follows him like a shadow that never leaves. And this is a very profound teaching. All of us here, I think, are familiar with these two verses right at the very beginning of the Dhammapada. But what we tend to take for granted is that for us, we are already having a lot of happiness. Sister Eileen has a good job, good parents, good everything. Not 100%, but at least 95%. Happiness follows her. She just told me, wow, we end with so many Dharma activity, I don't even know which one to attend. Do you know how much happiness that is? How much a blessing that is? You see, we take it for granted because like a shadow, which the Buddha used as an illustration, how many of us here are aware of our shadows? Very, very few. That happiness follows us like a shadow. That happiness came because of the causes that we planted. We had already forgotten about it. We take the shadow for granted. And you remember, if you walk into a dark room, the shadow will disappear. On the other hand, if a person speaks or acts with something unwholesome, pain follows him like the wheel that follows the ox. And there we moan and we groan because the wheel, the big cart that has to be pulled is a constant reminder every second of the burden. And I like to illustrate by just saying, none of us now have a toothache. Are we grateful for this shadow? The instant you have a toothache, at every moment that throbbing pain is like that cart that wheel that follows and we complain and we moan and we groan. So that is why a popular saying says, the wise person is afraid of horses. The ordinary man is afraid of fruits because the ordinary man is afraid of the unpleasant sensation he's having now. And he reacts to it in many different ways not realizing that his reaction is planting more seeds for the future. So the wise man is afraid of the seeds that he is planting. Is it going to give rise to good, pleasant, or bad and unpleasant? While the unwise man 
the ignorant man is afraid of the fruit that he is having now. That is unpleasant to him. He does not realize that that fruit will pass. But whatever he responds, he's creating and planting seeds for the future. So the Buddha's teachings is very simple. It basically is summarized for us to avoid whatever that is going to give rise to unpleasantness, all that is unwholesome, the seeds that can give rise to potential trouble. To embrace all that is good that will give rise to pleasant, wholesome fruits. And at the same time, to try and understand and in that understanding, purify our mind. Without understanding, we will not purify our mind. If it is a commandment, we will only follow under the threat of fire and brimstone. But if you understand, you do not need fire and brimstone. You know that that is the right thing to do. So first, if we are to have people who say, it is so sad, he has passed on. Or if we are to have people to say, he has lived a good life you will almost inevitably find that that person has lived in life, his life or her life in harmony, in peace. I hope we realize that our precepts and our eightfold path is what the Buddha used to teach us to live together in society in harmony. When you have right speech, right action, right livelihood, right thought, right intention, right effort, your life is going to be in a harmonious state of existence with your family and your neighbor. It is peaceful. It is stillness, calmness. So you can give this metta, you will also have metta in abundance. If you can live harmoniously, you will have harmony in return. So if you can love your neighbor, surely you can love your colleagues, etc. And always remember, may all beings be happy and well includes you. It includes brother Dr. Quack. It includes brother Kim Chi. It includes brother Danny. So when we say, may all beings be happy and well, it doesn't ask you to treat yourself any worse. It asks you to treat yourself just as well as you will want to treat any other person, friend, or relative. Now, very often you will hear this statement. Why is life unfair, people say. When I hear this statement, and sometimes very often expressed by my students, I get this, I get that, he get this, he get that. Why is life unfair to me? Then I always reply, why do you think life is fair in the first place? Whoever said it is fair? Why should it be? A fool is happy until his mischief turns against him. A good man may suffer until his goodness flowers. We think when we look at this little point in time, that life is unfair to me. We are not looking at the big picture. Life is what it is. It is what it is. It is neither fair nor unfair. It is, as a good friend and I often laugh, it's not whether you like it or you dislike it. It is. So you must learn to adapt and live with it to the best possible state. So whoever told you that life is fair in the first place or unfair? And here again, you have Kelvin. Why can't I stay up late? You people can. It's not fair, he screams. And the father says, the world isn't fair, Kelvin. And Kelvin says, I know, but why isn't it ever unfair in my favor? This is very profound. Many a times it has been unfair in your or my favor. 
Did he ever complain? No. He took that shadow for granted. But the instant we perceive it as unfair in my favor, it is that toothache, it is that cart that we are pulling, and we mourn and we groan. Now, brothers and sisters, I think a very important lesson I've learned is to just be afraid of the seeds, not be so afraid of the fruits. What are the seeds that I'm planting? Musa is the one who is wise, and they are afraid of the yin, the seed. The ordinary man, Johnson, is afraid of the guo, the fruit that he perceived as being unfair to him. Okay? Now, this is important. I taught the doggy how to whistle. And the friend said, I don't hear him whistling. And the boy replied, I said, I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. Now, this is actually very profound. When I saw this cartoon strip, I liked it very much. And I'm an obsessive keeper of good cartoons because they teach so much. You know, brothers and sisters, what I shared with you with regards to the first two verses of the Dhammapada, with regards to fruits and seeds, is nothing new. I am very sure every one of you have heard from someone, from a venerable, or you read it, because these are basic teachings of the Buddha Dharma, fundamental core teachings of cause and effects, yin guo, fundamental teachings about the Four Noble Truths. We all learned it, every one of us. But as is well illustrated in this cartoon, it was taught to us. But did we really learn it? For most of us, including myself, Many a times we learn it too late and too painfully. Now, think of our lives. Finally, when we lie in the coffin, as a big, huge canvas that every day Sister Eileen is painting. Every morning she wakes up, she gets her watercolor or her oil painting, and every day she's painting, painting. Then she goes to sleep. And then tomorrow she wakes up, and she's painting, painting, painting. Then she goes to sleep. So every day we are painting on this canvas that is personal to us. For some, it's a small painting. For others, it's a huge, huge Sistine Chapel sort of painting. But nevertheless, whatever it is, every moment we are painting, every moment we are painting on this canvas of our life. Is our painting a beautiful, peaceful painting? Or is it an agonizing scream? Only you, we know, only you know, only I know what we are painting. It is entirely in our hands. Now, many of you love classical music. Like me, I love classical music. Many of you, of course, know, and some do not know, that Tchaikovsky, that great composer, wrote his most beautiful works when he was in the depths of depression. And Mozart wrote his most wonderful works when he was under tremendous stress. So that painting that you and I are painting can be beautiful despite the circumstances or can be ugly despite the best materials. It is ultimately up to us. Now the syllabus. When we constantly have right effort, the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path, to keep on doing the things which we know are right to do and appropriate to avoid, as we shared just now, to do all good and to avoid all evil, then this right effort is helping us create a personality, a lifelong habit. And you know, many a times people just take the easy way out. And because we like to take the easy way out, the five precepts become very important. 
because there is a line that no matter what easy way we take, we must not cross. If you can do that, that I must not cross this line, then you have already taken back control of your lives. No one likes doing tough things, but doing tough things is subordinated to right effort, or in modern English, to the strength of your purpose. Actually, we all do have common sense. Again, Kelvin and Hobbes. Kelvin, how did you break this dish? I was carrying too much and it dropped. And the mother says, the problem is you have got no common sense. And Calvin says, I've got plenty of common sense. I just choose to ignore it. Now, isn't this true, Dhamma family? You know, we attend a dinner function and many people will offer you alcohol and you know you have to drive or et cetera, whatever you're doing. But because of peer pressure, you choose to ignore your common sense. And something that may be as tiny as that can actually have horrendous consequences. I just taught my students the last few days. There is no such thing as it's okay. I take a little bit of alcohol. I'm a social drinker. There is no such thing. It's crap. It's nonsense to put it in modern English because sister Eileen, one cannot be a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. And if you are pregnant, you'll become bigger and bigger and bigger until you poop, explode out. So, Sister Yin Ling, proud student of mine, she put it very well that despite what I have to teach, because it's in the syllabus, as to what is safe levels of alcohol, how many units, the British define less than four units a day as safe, Sister Yin Ling says it's rubbish. And officially, I told my students, for exams, you follow what I teach you. For life, you follow what Sister Yin Ling is saying. Because she is right. It is rubbish. Alcohol is so addictive that nobody will ever stop at one or two. First, it disinhib disinhibits our frontal lobe. So you will choose to ignore your common sense. So this line that I say, and no matter what easy way we choose, we must not cross this line, this traffic light, that if you rush through the red light, you're going to be in trouble. This is something very precious that the Buddha gave us, not to restrict us, but to protect us, just in case you choose to ignore your common sense. Now, the people who pass away, and all of us go around and say, he's a good man, he lived in peace, he did his best for society. He did his best to help. It's not going to be a man who is mindless, drunk, doing crazy things. So, yes, every second, every day is an opportunity for us to paint on this painting. Forget the past. We all had done silly things when we were younger. We had done things which hurt ourselves and others. If we need to apologize, we must apologize. Forget the hurt. It's over. We have to let go of it. Write it all meticulously down on a very important type of paper. Toilet paper. Write it all down meticulously on toilet paper. Then let that paper go where it should go. Flushed down the toilet. And we will try our very best to do what is wholesome, what is right, and carry on from now. Now, this is what I created under inverted commas. The first person I know who used this was my late father. When he passed away, I used this that I created to make the announcement on the internet, on Facebook, etc. But when you look at this, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, I hope you realize that one day, inevitably, it will be us there. 
So when you realize that, as the Buddha said, when you realize that, when you reflect on that every day, then the priorities of our life, our quarrels, swan laba. I let you win. I let go. I walk away. Nothing is worth the price of peace, especially as I begin, you begin, we begin to see the realities of life. Nothing is worth the price of peace. There are some things, yes, of course, we must dig our feet in and fight, but there are many, many occasions where to let go is the wisest decision. So how are we spending our time from the moment we wake up to the moment we sleep? Because we are painting that massive mural, that masterpiece, all right? Of course, we want to do what we ought to be doing, rather what we feel like doing, because feeling like doing might not be the most appropriate things. As taught by the Buddha again in the Dhammapada, easy to do are things that are bad and harmful. Exceedingly difficult to do are things that are good and beneficial. So from the moment we wake up to the moment we sleep, we got to have right effort that determination, that decision to do things that are good and beneficial. So let us wake up. Don't sleep all the time. Let us pursue that which is wholesome, that which is good, that we should plant good seeds that will give rise to wholesome fruits. Now, amidst the thousands of things that floods our lives every day, and we are seeing, let's do things which are wholesome and good. I have to also point out one thing. Please do not become an obsessive neurotic that everything must be perfect because things are not going to be perfect. In fact, things usually will not be perfect. So we will do our best and accept what is what is si zhe yang de la. And here Ajahn Brahm put it very well. Meditation, he said, is not about getting enlightenment or about getting an A star. Your meditation is good enough to get stillness and peace. The rest will come by itself. Do not have spiritual greed replacing material greed. Just do our best. And he said, getting a D is delightful. Getting an E is excellent. Getting an F is fantastic. A change in mindset. And I think this is important because if we are going to say, oh, Dr. Wong say must do the best, Dr. Wong say must do what is wholesome, and then become an absolute neurotic in chasing after perfection, then our lives are also going to be rather miserable. So do the good that we can, yeah, by all means. In all ways, whatever is within our means, in all the places, to all the people you can, as long as we can. And there are a lot of tiny, tiny things that we can do. All right? have compassion. I think that if you are to ask anybody, what is the main characteristic that you know among practicing Buddhists? I think many will say, oh, it's compassion, all right? Because they can see it by many organizations practicing this. And we can all do a little bit of this to make our painting beautiful. Metta, Karuna, I think are the bright colors that will brighten up that mural that Sister Eileen is painting. Now, it's not enough to be just busy. Eh? The question is, what are we so busy with? And again, here, Kevin and Hobbs playing. I won, I won, I won. I'm the champion. And after they look at each other, is that all there is? So what are you so busy with? 
Is it a life, an activity of significance? You can be very busy playing mahjong, you know, day and night. So that's the other thing, the other extreme, which I must bring you out from. So there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that we should not be done at all. Okay? Now, it's never too late as long as we are living. Tomorrow, tonight, next hour, we can always do something to improve. Our life, our, life, our family's time, our family quality, our society, our friends, our Kayana meters, etc. The smallest of action, remember, is better than, better than the noblest of intention. And I've said this so many times, you guys probably find I'm nagging. Metta and Karuna are verbs, not noun. If we talk about Metta, if we talk about Karuna, then we have to act on it. Any idea that is developed and put into action is more important than what we merely chant or recite or talk about. So we all have the same amount of time every day, how we use it, how we invest it, brothers and sisters, is entirely up to us. So use it well, ready or not, one day that will come to an end. The snake and the ladder game has ended and we either have become awakened and enlightened or at the 99 square, we go back to square one, like in the game, snakes and ladders, huang shen or transit. So while we can, let us live in joy, in metta, even among those who hate us. Live healthily, happily, peacefully, and in calmness. I think all these words we have been using at infinitum in Dharma sharing. And I give you this certificate to give you full my permission to be completely and totally happy, signed by none other than Ajahn Brahm. Nothing more valuable than happiness because the goal of Buddhism is happiness. Nibbana paramam sukham. Nibbana is the highest happiness. And as we walk this path rightly, we should be more and more and more happy. Every day you should be happier than the day before. So, of course, then one of you will pick up a question and say, but then uh, you have sometimes to scold some people. Yes, I'm an expert at scolding. Every day I scold to earn my living. My medical students have to be scolded when they have gone down the wrong path. So even if you are going to be scolding someone, you have to be the right someone, the right degree, the right purpose, and the right way. And sometimes, that is not easy. Here, Kelvin and Hobbes. Kelvin says, I've decided I want to be a millionaire when I grow up. And the father say, you have to work pretty hard to get a million dollars. And Kelvin say, no, I won't. You will. And the father say, me? And Kelvin say, I just want to inherit it. And you look at a situation like that and you wonder, how am I going to teach this kid? It's not easy. Teachers don't have an easy job, I can tell you. To have the right degree of discipline, to have the right words, and achieve a purpose at the end is not easy. So there are many other people who frankly do not value your contribution nor your time. In the Mangala Sutta, which my wife was just discussing with me, the very first Blessings, not to associate with fools, but to associate with the wise. That is a blessing. And you've got to recognize who are those who actually do not value your time, your effort, and in fact, might pull you down. So you've got to have that degree of discretion. And here, of course, mom and dad drive me crazy, Calvin says. They don't understand me and I don't understand them. It's hopeless, he said. I'm related to people I don't relate to. 
Now, of course, I understand that one of the big stresses in life is parents and children. And for those of you who have very good relationship with your parents or with your children, it is such a great blessing, such a great joy, because for many people, that is something that they do not have. So if you have that sort of relationship, do not worry about who will cry at your funeral, who will cry when you die. Do not worry that people will not say, oh, he has, got, he has lived a good life or not, because the very fact that you have that relationship speaks volumes. All right? So we are familiar with this, that the tragedy of life is not death, but what we let die within us while we live. Many people die at 40 and are buried at 80. Do not let that. Right effort. This is someone that is unfamiliar to you all, but he is a man whom I have the greatest of respect. He's not a Buddhist, but he is a good man. This is a man who has dedicated his entire life to helping the sick, the poor, the disadvantaged, and he is a man who has never looked at another person from the viewpoint of race or religion. I think that if we are to be good students of the Buddha Dharma, that is one of the fundamental lessons that we will need to incorporate into our lives. Because matter, may all beings be happy and well. It does not say, may all Buddhists be happy and well. It does not say, may all those who are in my lineage, my tradition, my yana be happy and well. It says, may all beings be happy and well. And this man here, Professor Khalid, Professor of Medicine that I work with, is a living example of those words. And I think that if we can incorporate that philosophy into our lives, we will be painting a very beautiful painting when we complete this particular life. Now forgiveness, forgive ourselves, forgive others, all right? We forgive partly because we want to let go, partly because we want our lives to be freed from a burden. And every minute, we hold on to a hurt, we are only hurting ourselves. Again, as Ajahn Brahm said, if someone had scolded you, you are a fool. And you keep on repeating that. Every other day you think that man scold me, I'm a fool. That man scold me, I'm a fool. And that man would have scolded you innumerable times. Forgive him, forgive yourself, because we need to let go of that huge burden. Spring has passed. Summer has gone, winter is here, and the song I meant to sing remains unsung. I have spent my days just stringing and unstringing my instrument. Let this not be the poem when we reach the end of our lives. Let us have used that instrument well, rather than keep on stringing and unstringing it without actually using it. Death is nothing to be afraid of. A life that is well lived, morally, nothing to be afraid of. And again, as I said right at the start, the Buddha taught us the recollection of death as a protective meditation, which we must do every day. Indeed, when a bad person dies, yeah, 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 then we are worried. But when a good person dies, there's nothing to be worried about. And only you know whether you are a good or a bad person. Sometimes you need to go against the flow. Sometimes you need to be different from all your colleagues, Sister Eileen, at the end of year party. Sometimes you need to be the one sober person. All right? So, now, 
A great life is nothing but a series of well-lived moments. Every moment we are living, that moment added together is today, last week, last year, last decade. So our lives is nothing but a series of moments. And if we live every moment well, well, then that's a life well lived. And nothing is a dress rehearsal. There is no dress rehearsal for life. Every moment is on stage. It is not a dress rehearsal. So now some people will talk to you about original sin. Now from the Buddhist viewpoint, there is no such thing as original sin. We do not have a distant ancestor who did something wrong. And because of that, every one of us is suffering because of that original thought done by a distant ancestor. That is simplistic and that does not hold well to logic. But what in Buddhism we have is what is called original stupidity. We all make originally by ourselves very stupid decisions because of how our mind functions. We think along the line of a separate, independent self of me versus you, I versus them. And once we start thinking that way because of our flawed perception, greed, hatred, anger comes in. All right? So once you are aware of these and this we have been sharing for the last 20 sharings, then we will understand better how this right view would serve us to make sure that this original stupidity that we had has now become far lesser than it was half a year ago, a year ago, or 10 years ago. So, no one ever told you to love yourself less. I keep on saying that. And no one told you not to forgive yourself. Whatever silly things we had done, we can forgive ourselves too. And the Buddha Dharma gives us eyes. It gives us vision to see all that I have shared with you just now. Do not believe me. Reflect on it yourself and see for yourself whether what the Buddha taught, which I attempted to share within my own limited understanding is correct or incorrect. Right views, right thoughts are the first two steps in our path. And that is why this is something important for us to know. And that is why we attend Dhamma sharing, Dhamma talks, we read books. A simple change in our thinking can change a lot of things in life. And for example, again, illustrated in the cartoon, here Calvin literally has lost his mind. So let us live a positive life. Let us not have a negative mind. All the thoughts, all the talks, all the thoughts that we share with regards to dukkha, with regards to aging, sickness, death, with regards to the inevitability of an aging body that will ultimately end, does not serve to make us negative. They actually do the opposite. They serve to make sure that we do not think that we are going to be healthy forever, that we are not going to decay, and that we are going to be like we are when we were 20 years old. So with that, we accept it. And within these realities of life, we lead a positive life. We make full use of what is given, what is available to us. A good life is when we assume nothing, help should not be taken for granted, do more, lead simple life, need less, smile often, dream big, laugh a lot, laugh at ourselves and realize how blessed we are. Of the 38 blessings in the Mangala Sutta, most of us have at least 30, if not more, of those blessings. So let us rise from a life chasing material success to finding significance. Overcome the angry by non-anger. Overcome the wicked by goodness. 
overcome the miser by generosity, overcome the liar by truth. There are many, many things for us to be grateful for. After this, open the Mangala Sutta and think how many of those auspicious blessings we have. And then be grateful for them and use them well. So who will cry when you die? If you had led a wonderful life with a beautiful painting, a masterpiece, there is no need to cry. We rejoice, we celebrate a life well lived. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dhamma family, for this opportunity. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Puna, for the sharing. To all our online viewers, please continue to post your question or the Facebook comments. Let us start with the questions from Hai Ing, SJBA. The question is, why is it difficult to accept death as part of life? Why is it difficult to accept death as part of life is because of one fundamental flaw. And this fundamental flaw, Dhamma family, is that we think along the lines of I. We think along the lines of a separate, independent person called Brother Bobby. A separate, independent entity. We think that, ah, oh, this entity has died. Without realizing that in reality, Brother Bobby is just a congregation, a mass of energy that is constantly flowing. And this energy, a composite of carbon and nitrogen, which makes his body of energies giving rise to feelings, perceptions, volition, consciousness, can actually be never destroyed. It merely transforms. All that carbon and nitrogen when he dies, will be recycled. Every single atom, just as every single atom in Brother Bobby now is recycled from something else. The energy that is his thoughts, etc., etc., energy will merely convert into another form and continue. So we can't accept it because of one, this false perception that you are a separate entity and this entity, oops, has died. And the other thing why people cannot accept is because of upadana, attachment. There are only four upadanas and one of them is the perception of an independent separate self. Even at the moment of death, people hold on and say, this self, I must not die then people are attached to sensual pleasures and views. Their views are so strong that I can talk till the cows come home. It will be with great difficulty to actually influence any views because your views are what you hold as your personality. To accept a change in your view is to accept that I have been wrong my whole life. And that is something very, very difficult. So death becomes easy to accept when you understand ultimate reality, in reality, nothing is born, nothing dies, nothing created, nothing destroyed. It merely transforms from one state to another. That is taken directly from the Heart Sutra. Now, that is why I said the Chinese culture is actually very much influenced by the Buddha Dharma. And the words that are used reflect it. Wang Sen is the proper word or formal word for someone who has died. This does not mean death. It means going to another birth. In English now, we use the word transit. So and so is in transit. He has gone on. All right, and of course, for the person who has become awakened, we say you see it. Oh, he has completed; he's no longer born. All right, I hope that that 
answer will help you. You've got to have the perception, the insight into what I shared, and then this will help you better. Thank you. Back to Sister Eileen. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next question is from Ko Wee Ken from PHBS. Question is, in one of the Kelvin and Hope's comic strips, Kelvin asks, is this all there is after victory? For many of us, we are looking for an accomplishment or an event that will give us meaning or satisfaction. We jump from one career to another, one movie to another, one romantic affair to another, one game to another, one travel destination to another, in search of a higher purpose, yet meaning seems to elude us. We find ourselves asking the same questions. Is this all there is? What is the solution? Well, Brother Ken, what is happening is the second noble truth. You jump from one career to another. Why? Because you are not satisfied. You want a better pay, a better whatever. Well, that is not wrong. I please do not get the impression that it is wrong. There's nothing wrong with career advancement. One of the great blessings in the Mangala Sutta is for you to be able to earn your keep. There's nothing wrong, but we have to balance it against sheer greed. The reason why we are never satisfied, even after Eileen has changed jobs so many times, and now let's make her CEO of, let's say, a big German pharmaceutical. Let's say she's the CEO of Bayer. Then she wants to be the CEO of Pfizer. So human beings are like that. Human beings will never find that it is enough because there is no end to our greed. Why do human beings jump from one affair to another affair? Well, this I've explained, was it a week ago or last or two weeks ago? Because your limbic system and your brainstem gears you for sensual pleasures. You want one conquest after another more sensual pleasures after more sensual pleasures. So what is the solution? Learn the Buddha Dharma. Learn the reality that while this jump, this change will give you temporal pleasures, sensual gratification, they are very temporary, very fleeting, and they come with very high cost. It comes with much dukkha. The Buddha himself said after his enlightenment that this is a generation, even 2,000 years ago, that is completely mesmerized by sensual gratification. They are not going to be interested in the Dhamma. And well, your question here basically says that you want more and more and more. And until you be able to realize that, yes, there must be earning a living, there must be this skill to support your family, you must not go to the other extreme of a mere pursuit of materialism and sensual gratification, and then letting these seeds that you plant bloom into food to come. To come means dissatisfaction, stress. I can tell you business people are very, very stressed. Yeah, they make lots of money but they are also very, very stressed. So where is your standing? What do you want? It is not in my position to tell you. It is only your own personal insight into the Buddha Dharma that will tell you where is it that you are standing and what is it that you want and whether you wish to have a different kind of happiness from the happiness of sensual gratification. If you wish that, then the path that you choose to walk will be different. Otherwise, you will just keep on going from one job, one affair, and one movie to another, one game to another. And as Calvin said, is that all there is? Because very soon, that joy is going to be over. Thank you, sister. Eileen, I apologize that I have to use so much of you as an example, but you are appearing right in front of me. No issue. Dr. Punya, there's another question from Brother Leong Yu Ming. How can one prepare to die a good death? Brother Yu Ming, 
thank you for attending again. Um, there's a coming Breaking Myth talk. I can't remember which one. If I'm not wrong, it's number 24, which will be on this topic. So I think I will answer that question when we reach Breaking Myth 24. I think it's 24. All right, Brother Yumi, back to you. Okay, there's a question from Saramban Sudama, Lim Kota. He asked, someone once told me that you or someone close who knows you to record all your good deeds so that in times when close to death, someone should read out to remind you that you have done all this and it's your refuge. My question is, if I do not record and have even intentionally or unintentionally forgotten all these wholesome deeds, would it make a difference? Well, thank you, Brother Lim. Now, now there's no need to record. Huh? Everything is taken on the handphone. So everything is in Facebook. Whatever food I eat also is on Facebook. Well, that's because I want my children to see what I'm eating. And I, you will realize, sorry, not I will realize, you will realize that much of our lives now is known to Google. You just go to Google Pictures and you will see all of it listed there. Now, it does serve a good purpose because there are a few things which are important at carry death. And again, as I said, Breaking Myth 24, we'll talk about that. Very briefly, you need to have people who are dying to know that they have lived a life that is of significance, that has been a life that is well-lived. And that's very, very reassuring. And a very good way is just by showing them on their handphone or Android or iPad, the good things they had done from pilgrimage to refuge to dana to whatever good things that is documented nowadays. And that helps them in attaining peace of mind as they enter the last hour to minutes of their life. So my question here is, as you said, if you had not recorded, well, start taking pictures, it's good, or just take a look at the old photos and digitalize it. It does make a difference because at the moment, a lot of people want reassurance from the family. Have I treated my family well? Have I done my duty as father or mother? And people need reassurance. Family, if around, of course, it's very reassuring. But nowadays, I'm very sad to say this. We live in a very nuclear family. We have relatives all over the world. With COVID, it is impossible for them to come back. And the time they come back is when the government gives them an allowance to come back to attend a funeral. It's too late. Funerals are for the living, not for the dead. So these reassurance by family members around the dying person, sadly, is going to be more and more difficult as the nuclear family is the norm now. So pictures become progressively more important. Even Zoom contacts of children telling the parents of their love, of their forgiveness, seeking forgiveness, and of all the reassurance that yes, you had done your duty well as a father, you had provided well, and yes, you are a wonderful mother. So all right, Brother Lim, be patient another two weeks. Okay, another question from Brother Le Leong Yuming again. Is crying when, da when one dies a choice knowing aging, sickness and death is inevitable? For me, I will rejoice because it will be a new beginning and chapter of a new existence. Writing on uh, Brother Leong's uh, question, I also wanted to have the same uh, thing because I myself do not want people to cry when I die. So yeah. how do I manage my close one feeling that way, you know, but my close one does not have exposure to the Dharma. Thanks. If there is no exposure to the Dharma, of course, and the people love you, they will miss you. They will obviously cry. Remember when the Buddha was dying, Ananda was crying. And the Buddha had to literally have a few strong words with Ananda. Now, those enlightened, awakened ones who are around did not cry. But Ananda, who was a Sotapan at that time, was crying. And the Buddha had to actually point it out to him that had I not taught you that all that you love, that you associate, that you see as wholesome, all that you have attachment for will dissociate. So now for people who know that you had lived 
a wonderful life. And these people are people who still need you. And I often joke with my students, please don't make me angry. I might have a heart attack or a stroke and die. And then my students will say, no, 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 Prof Wong, please don't die, please don't die. We still need you to teach us. And I say, look at the words you said. You actually don't give any thought as to whether I die or live. You are only concerned because you need me to teach you. That is expressed by your own words. So for many times, people cry. One is because this person is needed. There are still things that this person can provide for. And if he goes, then well, that material need is cut off. That supply is cut off and people die. That's not a very good thing. But provided, let's say we had all done our duty, we have made sure they are well, they are well educated, they have done well, we have lived a good life. Of course, being an unenlightened being, they will cry because they missed us. I hope you realize that grief is the price you pay for love. I repeat, grief is the price that you pay for mundane love. Because mundane love means attachment. And attachment means separation. First noble truth. So if you understand the Dhamma better, you will still grieve, but you will grieve less. It's only a fully awakened being whose emotions are stilled that will not grieve because he is looking at it from a completely logical aspect that we have actually discussed. But for the vast majority of us, being unenlightened, we are still attached. Attachment will give rise to grief because now there is separation. First noble truth, separation from those that you love, that you want to be with. So as long as we are unenlightened beings, we are going to go through that process. It's the price we pay for mundane love. So if you wish to lessen it, then they will need to be educated. They will need to learn and that will lessen it. But I think that it will be quite near impossible to say zero unless you live in a community of Arahans. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next time, I think I will write an SOP to my relatives. <laughs> say don't cry. <laughs> Otherwise, people say you cry, then we will like, uh, no, More then the, 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 it cannot be Wang Sun, you know. <laughs> right. Okay, there's another question from um, Brother W.H. Chan. I heard a venerable reminded us, Death is not a regret, but it is regretful if we never do any good things before our death. What's your comment? I wouldn't say before our death. I think it's our whole life. Death is an event, an inevitable event for any one of us. It's an event in which we will transit to a new form, whatever that form is. Death is that event, and it is sad or regretful if a person did not use whatever time he had to learn the Dhamma. Again, just discussing with my wife just now, Mangala Sutta, she was asking me, good blessing, vast learning, she read. And she asked me, what vast learning? Well, I said, it will depend on the occupation. And she said, what if I'm a housewife? Then I say, well, housewife has a lot of skills that you need to have. You need how to manage the family, manage the children. You need to cope, you need to manage the household, etc." But I said, even if it is an engineer with lots of engineering knowledge or a doctor with fantastic medical knowledge, what we are referring to with vast learning there is not just mundane knowledge or mundane learning. We are also talking about supramundane. That means your knowledge of the Dhamma. So here, death is an event. Just one event in this big painting. It is regretful if you had spent this entire lifespan of whatever years and never learned any Dhamma, never learned how to do good, never learned any sila, never learned any mind restraining, never learned any mind discipline, then yes, that is regretful because that means it is going to be purely karma which will determine your future state of affairs. 
It is not by choice, but by chance now. If you had done what is good, all that is good, avoid all that is evil and purify your mind, then as Ajahn Brahm always said, what is there to be afraid of? There is nothing to be afraid of. And I believe personally that if you can have such learning, reading and insight that the Buddha's Dharma is absolutely logical, correct to you, i.e. you have no more doubts about the Buddha Dharma. And you also realize, whether through studying biology, physics or science, that this body is not yourself, that this body is merely a compound that has been regenerating and regenerating and regenerating every day of your life. And one day will just break down and that this is not yourself. And the third, that you have the insight that rites and rituals are merely rites and rituals and not the way to awakening. And you are really a sort of pan. And if you are a sort of pan, you will not have a re-becoming or a recycling into something unwholesome. So as what Ajahn Brahm always reassures us, if you have lived a good life of morality, discipline, metta, karuna, and you did try your best to train your mind, you've got nothing to be afraid of. It is just transit. It is just a door to another form. That's all. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Let us take one last question. Brother Hai Ing, how do we transform a loved one's death into happiness for those still living? Well, I would say first, now almost all the funeral homes that I've seen have big TVs. All right, almost all the funeral homes, at least the ones in JB. I have to apologize, I'm familiar with the ones in JB and the ones in KL because I've got relatives in KL. And they've got big LED TV screens. Please use that LED TV screen instead of just showing when is he going to be cremated or when is he going to be buried. Just connect a computer or a thumb drive to it and let it run all the good things that this person has done in his life. You know, when you attend people's wedding, they force their baby photos on you. Well, I'm talking about the same principle, except of baby, instead of baby photos, if he's a teacher, show all the students that he has taught, what have they become now? Show if, he, let's say, he's a doctor, his practice, etc. If he's a Dhamma Dutta worker, what he has been doing. If he's an engineer, all the beautiful buildings that he has built. And we celebrate a life. Of course, having said that, as two weeks from now, you will see me share how the person die is going to make a huge difference. If it is a death, which is slow, a dying process, which is slow and progressive, cancer renal failure, then people adapt, people know. And in situations like cancer, in fact, death is something that the person might look forward to because it is an escape. As the late Chief Venerable Dhanaman Nanda used to joke, this old car is all broken and worn like a cart which is all spoiled. Why are you still hanging on to it? He said, get a new passport, go on to a new car, a new vehicle. So for those people with chronic illnesses, which are very uncomfortable. Death is in fact something they look forward to. It's an escape. Now, the problem is with sudden deaths. And yes, it's very, very difficult for the family to accept because it is not something that they are mentally prepared. Then in that situation, the only way is we have to reassure the grieving family members that we are there for them, that this person, we will do whatever we can to help we will do whatever we can to support and put metta karuna into action and not words. All right. Thank you, Sister Eileen. Thank you so much. That gives me an idea <laughs> on what the, to, to display about the good deeds because uh, normally in the Buddhists, um, unlike the Christians, they have the wake and we have someone who actually, um, you know, be there to tell everyone, those who are present, uh, about their good deeds, what this person uh, does uh, during uh, their, while oh. they are still alive. Yeah, Thank You haven't you. attended any funerals in JB because that's what we do. Very modern one, you know, uh, funerals in JB, very, very modern one. That's, that's giving an idea. 
Thank you so much for that. <laughs> right. Thank you uh, to all our online uh, viewers. Uh, thank you so much yeah, uh, for participating. Um, and...